And just so you all know, you are now officially being recorded. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. I think it can be helpful to tell folks that you're doing that um, so that if they don't see what they expect to see, they can tell you. So I'm sharing second screen. Let me know if you can see my Google Sheet or Google Slides. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and present. Today's webinar topic is screencasting. I'll adjust my thing just a little bit here. Still see me? Okay. It's nice for your, for your students if you go ahead and make sure they can see your whole head and not half your head. So it's worthwhile taking a few minutes to adjust. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to cover in this screencast. Um, it's going to be about half of it is pedagogy and half of it is technology um, because it, there's no sense in using a tool if you don't have to these days. So you want to reserve your energy and time to do what's most going to meet your learning goals. And if screencasting is that, then great. And I'll help you know how to know if you should make a screencast or not. So that first question, to cast or not to screencast, we'll talk about best practices for using them in your teaching. We'll talk about ways to make your screencasts better. Uh, and then I'll give you um, an overview of the tools to use to make screencasts. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about how to upload those files to YouTube uh, once you get them, and then how to embed those YouTube videos back in Moodle. And, um, Nancy, your students basically will follow all of these same steps pretty much. It's the same basic process. Uh, let me make sure that I can see the chat. There it is. Excellent. Okay, I think we're ready to roll. Okay, so when you're trying to decide um, if you should or should not do a screencast, Ask whether or not a screencast would add clarity or continuity or community to your course. Um, if it's something that would be explained much more easily or clearly with you showing people your computer screen or capturing your camera, then it's a good thing to do. You can make it clearer than you could if you explain it or describe it in writing. If it adds continuity, maybe you always do a thing um, with a PowerPoint or with maybe you demonstrate something. I mean, Nancy, maybe you demonstrate a kind of pronunciation or some sort of dialogo or something like this at the beginning of class, and this would make it feel like the same thing you always do. Then that's a really good reason because everything feels weird to your students right now. So anything you can do that makes it feel kind of the same can help them tap back into all of the learning frames that are already in their habits and their minds. So continuity is a good reason to do a screencast. And closely related to that is this idea of community. Um, if they can see your face and hear you talking to them, um, that can add to community. Um, doing a live Zoom session is even more for the sake of community, but just like all of you, I mean, and for the past two weeks, every time I Zoom with anybody, as soon as they see my face, people just sort of light up and they're like, oh my gosh, it's you. Oh my gosh, it's another person. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> I keep hearing people say that and it's not just because people are, are being nice. I think it's because it's nice to see the face of someone that you, you know and you trust. And um, so I think those are the good reasons to think about how much payoff do you get in these three sort of categories for a screencast. Um, so if you're gonna be using screencasts in your teaching, I think it's good to think about what kind of content you're gonna create. So you could just do a lecture where you're just talking to them and you just capture with your camera. Or it could be um, where you're actually catching, you know, a PowerPoint or, or some sort of a slide share. So what is it that you're actually creating? Um, that's, I mean, screencasting is a technique, but what you actually capture could be quite varied. You always wanna chunk it always. Um, and I'll show you some data about that in just a minute. Um, and it should matter. Make sure that what you create matters to their learning and their performance in the class. So when we're talking about kind of content, um, things like intros, introduction to content, an overview, um, or orientation to this is how the class is going to work now. I mean, those are all really valuable um, 
ways to use screencasting. You might debrief after you had a stack of essays or a quiz or something. So those are really valuable um, kinds of screencasts to create. And those ones tend to have a webcam more than a screen share. So you're talking to them more than you're, you're teaching them. Um, and they tend to go more toward this question of community connection and giving this teacher presence, right? Um, which is a really important element in any online teaching. It has shown to be very, um, it just, it makes a big difference to the learning outcomes, whether or not students perceive that the teacher is really present. And if they can see your face um, while you're telling them an introduction or an overview or a debrief, that can go a long way. Um, you can also create lectures and demonstrations, which tend often to be more slides and screen share than webcam. So more importantly, they need to see what's on your screen than they need to see your face. Um, and think about this if you're going to do a lecture, give them something that they can't get on their own. Could they get this basic content from the reading? If they got it from the reading, maybe you don't need to make a screencast summarizing the chapter that you also ask them to read. If you ask them to read the chapter and then you give them a summary, pretty quickly they're going to learn they don't need to read the chapter if you're going to provide the summary. Um, or maybe it's something that you yourself are doing interpretation or taking a specific sort of position on the reading that they've done. So um, just try to make it valuable in that way, something that they couldn't just get from interacting with the content you've already assigned them. So that third point about best practices was chunking. And really, six minutes is the sweet spot, um, as you can see from this image here. Um, this um, researcher analyzed how long students watched educational videos. And you notice that by 12 minutes, it just starts to drop off really, really steeply. Even certificate earning, and I don't know what the difference is between that group, they, may be, they seem to be more, um, more engaged, but all of them, it just falls off pretty precipitously after 12 minutes. So you definitely, I mean, you can see what happens at 40 minutes long. I mean they just stop watching. <laughs> so, um, and here's a link, I'll send out this PowerPoint to you guys. And this is a live link to that study, in case you're curious. Um, but you wanna keep it between six and 12 minutes. So Nancy asks a question, how can we get the same view on our student screen? Um, PowerPoint and videos of our faces, I'm gonna show you. I mean, what you're seeing with me now, showing the PowerPoint in my video. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all great. I've done is share my screen in Zoom. So if you're live with your students, you just say, I'm gonna share my screen now, and they'll see exactly what you're seeing right now. So and if but, you, go ahead. Oh, sorry, but, but Robbie, if you've got 20 students, are you gonna have itsy bitsy thumbnails of all 20, or if you this, wanna all see That's the... user controlled, right? They can decide how big and how to arrange those things, I think. I okay. haven't tried to see what happens when I play around with the per participant view while someone else is presenting. Al, do you have insight into what options you have for that? Oh. So, so what is precisely the question? Are you worried that if you're screencasting that this would, you would get all these, view, these windows or um, is it just while you're recording a, a synchronous session, Nancy? I think, I, so I'm going to be doing synchronous sessions and I want it to be just how Robbie's got it with us now where the students, they're going to see me for a while and then we're going to go look at a PowerPoint, but I love the idea of keeping not just my face on the screen uh -huh. while the students look at the PowerPoint, but also their compañeros faces. So I was wondering, and I'm seeing at the top of my, as a participant, I can see that I've got little choices at the very tip top of the video area that says mm -hmm. hide thumbnail, hide thumbnail video, show active speaker video, which I guess would be only Robbie speaking maybe, mm -hmm. or, or I guess whoever's speaking at the time, right? right. Mm -hmm. And then show thumbnail video and show grid video. So I guess I, as a student can choose. Right, that's user control. So each yes. student can decide what they see, right, Al? Oh, yes. yes. But if, so what I'm gonna show you about using Zoom to screencast, it's only gonna be you in that session. So they won't see other faces at all because you're just using this meeting tool as a screencasting tool. Just sort of hacking the tool 
to work for multiple things. So you only have to learn one tool if that's all you want to learn. Okay. And Great. a really stupid basic question, but when you say screencast, basically you're saying record the screen. Yep. Got it. Okay. Broadcasting your screen, but by recording. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So be... keep it short, chunk it up. Make it uh, matter yeah. was the last one. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just a pedagogy here. Uh, on the previous screen, you showed how, how um, interest dropped off after about 12 to 15 minutes. And so um, are we going to talk about them back, whether doing a poll or taking a break or what method uh, might re-engage the students after they that duration point around 9 to 12 minutes? Well, what we tend to recommend is that you just make the whole the whole recording one unit of 10 to 12 minutes and then you make multiple chunks and you might want to include a little quiz or a small reflective question at the very end of a video or separately in your Moodle course that asks them to just sort of uh, process the bit of information you've given them and prepares them for the next one rather than a long video that has questions and polls in the middle and so they're sort of pausing and, and asking a question, you would just make it a discrete video that's only 12 minutes. The other reason for that is it's much easier to manage short files when you're trying to push them up to YouTube or push them up to Box or if you're sharing the whole file itself, and we'll talk about all those technical um, questions later. It's just simpler if the whole video is only six to 12 minutes long, ideally. Did that answer your question? It does, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, although anything that gets them to stop and try to um, apply their learning or do some sort of reconciliation of their learning uh, will be useful to sort of get them, um, keep them from tapping out, basically. Cool. Okay. So this sort of relates to that question, Hanu, which is you should make it matter. Don't ask them to watch a video if it isn't going to matter to their success in your class. And some ways to make it matter is to make them do like a post view quiz. And this can be done in Moodle or in lots of different ways, just so that they have to prove that they've watched it. You can ask them, which is actually better, is like a summary reflection assignment. So you can use a forum in Moodle or an assignment tool in Moodle. We have a webinar recording, I believe, which I need to publish, um, note to self, um, from last week that, um, should be helpful for them to summarize what you've done, but also reflect on what they learned from it or how it connects to other things. Um, that's a good way to make them do something with the screencasts that you've put in your class. And the last um, sort of another way, not the only way, but the, another way to make it matter is asking them to apply that content now in for some sort of a learning activity. Um, then they know that it matters that they watch your screencast because they're going to do something with it. So that's really, really helpful. Um, communicating why and how that content is important is just a sort of a basic um, transparent teaching um, sort of tenet of transparent teaching. If they know how and why when they get ready to watch your video, how and why is this going to matter to them, they're more likely to persist and pay attention. Um, and they have to actually believe that it's important. <laughs> Otherwise, they just won't watch it. And you're not in the classroom making them pay attention. So that's uh, pretty important. Um, making a better screencast. These are just some tips. There, there are others, but it's really good to plan out what it is you're going to show. And just building slides, PowerPoint slides, is already a way of planning that most of us do anyway. Uh, and the same way that you would plan a live lecture, you should plan your screencast. And part of that planning is deciding where you can pause, what, where's a natural chunking place. And what would you need to say at the end of that little chunk of video to prepare them to connect to the next one? And when you do like part two of four, you might need to remind them in the very beginning what you last finished in part one so that they can do that connective work between them. Um, use a mic if you have one, even just earbuds as you can see, or AirPods as Nancy's gonna um, order so she can move around. Um, it's really, really helps with the audio quality. Um, as Al often um, says, if your students will tolerate bad video, better than they'll tolerate bad audio. It's really difficult to listen to six or seven minutes of really bad audio. So it's worthwhile, even just cheap earbuds with an inline mic are better than nothing. So consider that if you have them. Uh, so 
if you can use an ethernet cable, if you find that your uh, video quality is low, because Zoom is just gonna squish down your video until it works well with your bandwidth. So if your bandwidth drops off, the quality of the video is gonna get less and less and less. And because you're recording that video, you want it to be higher quality if you can. So um, if you find that it's not up to the quality you like, you might want to um, try to connect with an ethernet cable. Um, you might wanna turn off notifications or close applications because what keeps happening to me is that I forget to set do not disturb on my Mac and then I'll be making a recording for you guys and I'll get an email notification, bing, and it comes sliding across the corner of the screen and then I have to start over or blur it out with some kind of an editing tool, neither of which is a fun thing to do at the end of a long day. So I recommend trying to close any applications you don't absolutely have open, have to have open and consider putting your sleep, putting your computer to sleep in terms of do not disturb. Don't put your computer to sleep, that was the wrong thing. Set do not disturb um, in your settings, um, however that works. And we're finally getting to the conversation that Al and Nancy are having already about this quote, which I'm still gonna give to you, Al. You just have to just accept it. Um, Perfect is the enemy of good. He maybe didn't generate it, but he definitely keeps it going round. And it's really true. In this case, for your screencast, don't remake it seven times because you said, um, or you got off track, or you accidentally told people to put their computer to sleep, which is totally the wrong thing to do. Just say, whoops, never mind, forget what I just said. Here's the right thing, and just move on, um, especially given the situation where now nobody expects professionally produced teaching videos. Um, they just wanna see you, the person they know and trust, and you know, get learning from you if they can. Okay, do we have any questions about the pedagogy part? Because next we're gonna move on to tools, and I just wanna make sure that everybody's ready to go on to that next part. Yeah, Robbie, this is Robin. I'm just thinking about, I don't know what other uh, people have in terms of the time length, but I will be teaching a three and a half hour class so and at the graduate school level. So I was just wondering, that six to 12 minute chunking, is that across adult learners? I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I, a way to refine my question because it's kind of- Right, uh, you're like, I, can't we expect adults to pay attention longer than six minutes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a fair question. And, you know, graduate students probably have trained themselves to attend longer than undergraduate students, but you do start to lose the quality of their attention. Mm. That's just basic human processing of media. Our attention does start to drop off after just a little bit of time. So some techniques, if you're going to make a recording, then record small, high impact I mean, these are the cliff bars of videos here, like instructional video, just like all the nutrition as tightly compact as you can make it. If you also want to meet with them live in real time, mm -hmm. that that might be something separate. So um, it bears thinking about what do I try to do live with them synchronously? And what do I try to make a screencast and provide for them asynchronously? Mm -hmm. And what I tend to draw on um, right now and what we've been telling people is to think about blended learning theory, which is what can they deal with or flipped learning theory? Mm -hmm. What can they do independently? What information can they um, encounter independently sufficiently? And what mm -hmm. then do they need to do? What learning activities can they do together with you live in real time? And to think about those things sort of separately if they just are encountering a concept, adult learners can watch a video or read a chapter or read an article. And then when you come together live, you come together live for less than three hours, perhaps. I don't know, you'll have to think about what your accreditation says about that, but mm -hmm. maybe you can come together for one hour and what you do is have high impact discussion about that, or you get, you get groups to report out to you what insights they took away from that. And that kind of interaction is hard to do asynchronously, or it's not as, um, it might be a richer thing to do live and in person when you can respond to them and respond to their questions immediately versus something that they could do on their own. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, thank you. Those are all helpful suggestions. And what I'm hoping is for the remainder of the 
three weeks of spring term, at least in uh, the School of Graduate Psychology, I'm hoping that the faculty who had to adjust to this more quickly than those of us who have a little lead time can give us some feedback about what worked well and what didn't in a three and a half hour or three hour class once a yeah. week. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, we are a really small little group right now, like right. seven, eight, nine of us maybe right now. And we're going to do this for about an hour. And you can see how um, passive almost all of you are mm -hmm. right now. Um, it's very difficult to be robustly interactive when I'm the one sort of leading, unless you're doing something like breakout groups or everybody comes with a very specific task. So each person is going to take a turn presenting or sharing their thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's a way to make a more meaningful um, virtual se session like this versus basically I'm giving you a live lecture and you're just presenting. But I could make this a recording, which I'm doing, and other folks might be like, oh, I could just watch this, you know. Right. Yeah, so, no, all of this is great because I know my anxiety spiked when I first got the feedback because I'd submitted my syllabus that we would be doing this online. You know, my thought to myself was it's a challenge enough to sustain attention for three and a half hours when you're in a bricks and mortar classroom face to face, let alone how to do it um, at a distance. So all of these are very helpful suggestions, which I can incorporate, but I'm always open to feedback from my colleagues who are doing this as we speak. Absolutely. So, okay, right. I'll meet myself again. Thanks. Sure, thanks. Great. Any other questions about the pedagogy or best practice before we move on? Al, did you want to weigh in with anything? Nope. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so we'll hear the tools. Let's get into the tech now. Um, the tools that we tend to um, have handy and that we have in, at Pacific um, to make a screencast. You can make a screencast with Zoom. You can make a screencast with Screencast-O-Matic. I'm going to uh, demo both of those things. You can also use Google Meet, which is just part of your Boxer apps. When you get to Boxer apps, Google Meet will be one of the apps that you have there. And it basically is like a Google version of Zoom. And you can record, and those recordings will be automatically saved to your Google Drive. We are getting reports that sometimes the video quality isn't quite as good as it is with, or it's maybe a little clunkier than Zoom, just so you know there. Um, but that is an option if for some reason Zoom isn't working out for you. And then if you're a Mac user, QuickTime is um, standard on all devices, all um, Macs, and you can make uh, an audio recording, a video recording, or a screen capture recording. What you can't do is switch back and forth between your webcam and then, okay, now I'm going to switch to sharing my screen. Now I'm going to switch back. You can't do that um, so well with QuickTime, or you can't do it at all. They'd be separate videos. So just to know what some of the capabilities are of those tools. And today I'm going to show you Zoom, Zoom and Screencast-O-Matic. And one thing we do, um, I, I have been recommending is if you're okay with Zoom and it works out for you, then you only have to learn two tools, Zoom and Moodle. That could be all you need. Um, if Zoom feels weird to you for doing screencasts, Screencast-O-Matic is also super easy. And most of the process, once you get that file, the, once you get the video file, the process is the same. Okay, so we're gonna start with Zoom and there are two different sort of ways to run your screencast when you're doing Zoom. One of them is you do just like I did today where you start the Zoom session and you start recording while your face is still there. You know, your webcam is still capturing. You're like, hi guys, I'm making this recording now. This is gonna talk to you about past perfect. Um, okay, now I'm gonna share my screen and then you share your screen. And meanwhile, Zoom is just capturing whether it's your webcam or your screen capture. And then after you get done showing them whatever you were showing them, maybe your PowerPoint slide, you can stop share, Zoom's still recording, and it comes back to your face in the camera. And you're like, okay guys, that was it. Look for part two, it should be in Moodle, bye. Okay. Um, in that scenario, your face starts and ends the session. And there are some pedagogical reasons to do that. Community among them, right? They, and continuity, it's you, and they're like, oh yeah, I know you. And that's really nice. Um, so I'm going to share these slides out if you want so that you don't have to feel like you have to take a zillion notes or take photos. You could take all the photos you want. 
Nancy, but I will also give you the slides so you don't have to if you don't want to. The other thing you can do if you don't want your face to start the recording, like if you don't want the the YouTube video to start with your face and end with your face, um, you can start your meeting, share your screen, and then record, and then stop recording before you stop sharing. Then the only thing that ever shows up is whatever you were sharing, which is probably your PowerPoints. Um, the reason I talk about that one separately is because the record button is in a different place if you're sharing the screen. So that's why we have to talk about those two things separately. Okay. Um, we're going to do the first one where you just start your Zoom and your smiling face starts and ends the session. Oh, look, there's my smiling face or not. And my favorite glasses before they broke. Sad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a moment of missing those nice glasses, but okay. So what you're going to start out with is you launch your session and you're the only one in it. You don't have anybody visiting you in that session. It might be helpful if nobody else has the link to this, this Zoom session, then nobody can accidentally dive bomb your session and wreck your recording. So that might be helpful. Um, but once you're in the session, it's just you, you push, press the record button, as you can see here. Please record onto your computer, not into the cloud, unless you're on an iPad, in which case you don't have a choice but to record to the cloud. But if you have a regular computer, please record onto your computer instead of to the cloud so we reserve um, space in the cloud. It's gonna get really full really fast. So once you say record and record on this computer, you're gonna get this little message up in the top corner, said the recorded file is gonna be converted when the meeting ends. So once that's going, you're good to go. You can trust that the recording is being captured and at the end, Zoom's gonna give you a file. The reason I'm showing you screenshots is because I can't share what I see in a screencast, in a Zoom session, because you won't see my view, because I'm the presenter. Okay, once you're all done making your recording, then you say end meeting, which is down here. End meeting for all, because you're the host, you're gonna have to end it for anybody who is in there, which should be nobody <laughs> except for you. Um, you have to say end meeting for all to get on out of there. Then what you're gonna get is this dialogue box here that lets you know the recording is being converted. My advice is just leave it alone. Time to go get a cup of tea and let it render. When it's all done, this will be like 100%. Hopefully, it will give you the save dialogue box and you can decide where you want it to go. I don't know, Al, if you have insight into this, but I am hearing from lots of faculty and in my own experience, sometimes you don't get the save dialogue and I'm not sure what that's about. The default, this might actually be something to write down, um, is that it probably, Zoom tends to save your recordings in documents. Not my documents, but documents. And sometimes that isn't a common folder that people have especially if on your, you're on a Mac, you may not have that in your recents and you might have to hunt for it. If you have a hard time finding that, shoot me an email. We figured that out before. <laughs> so the, the hardest thing about Zoom screencasting is just finding where Zoom put your recordings. But once you, there will be a big folder that says Zoom. Um, if you get the save option, then you can pick where you want it to go. And I highly recommend putting it where you know you can find it. Uh, maybe on your desktop or something like that. Um, so hopefully you'll get this one. If you don't, look in my look in documents or email me. Once you get there, you'll see um, these files. This is the view from a Mac, but um, it'll be in a folder that either has all of this timestamp and then your meeting room number, um, or it might just say Zoom. It, I've seen it look different here. Um, so Linda says Firefox, um, oh, Al's going to answer that. Great. I'll let Al answer that question. So the, the video file that's generated will say Zoom and it'll be numbered and it will be an MP4. That's kind of how you can recognize when you're looking at the right thing. Zoom also generates just an audio file of each of those recordings. You probably won't need that, not for what we're doing, but just that, that explains the other stuff that you will see when you're in that file. You want to pay attention to the mp4 file because that's your video file okay so that's if you want to start with your face and then you can capture whatever is happening including a screen share and you end with your face and then you find that recording file 
Um, if you don't want your face in there at all, you want to start sharing first before you record it. Let me show you where the record button is from the, the, the screen share view. So you're going to start your session and you haven't started recording yet. You're going to click on share. Then you have to decide what the thing is you want to share. There are lots of options here, but usually it's your desktop if that's where you have your um, PowerPoint open or you're gonna open your PowerPoint to your desktop. Often it will also be, there might be PowerPoint as an application and you can click that. So it's good to experiment a little bit before you're actually making your recording just so that you feel comfortable with that screen share button. Once you've selected what you wanna share, you click share. In this case, there was a PowerPoint um, file, so you can share that one. Now that you're sharing, you'll get this little notice here that you're, you have a stop share button and then a share. If you hover over that with your mouse, what you'll get is this little ribbon of extra tools and you wanna click on more. There's lots of good things under here. One of them is chat. Like when you're sharing, if you click on chat, you can see if your students chat to you because otherwise you won't see that. Um, that happened to me the first recording I did. So when you're sharing, you might wanna turn on chat so that you can see if they chat to you. They won't know that you can't see the chat, so they will might try to communicate with you that way. So it's good to turn that on. Um, that won't be captured in your recording. But once you get here, you're in share, you can click on record on this computer. That's where the record button is once you're sharing. Okay, and then the rest goes just the same. You share all you like, Rather than stopping share, which is going to pop you back to your camera, if you want to stop on the last slide and never come back to your face, you go back to this little mouse over, back to more, stop recording. So that's the difference between the operations, whether you start with your webcam and then share and then come back to webcam, or you just start out and share. The record button is just in a different place. Okay. Stop recording. Okay, now, do you guys have any questions about Zoom recording with Zoom? No, but that was super helpful because I tried to do the only record my PowerPoint and I couldn't for the life of me find the record button. So thank you. You Robin. didn't know to find the three dots and the down the side? Yeah, me neither. Tatiana taught me where that was. So um, thanks, Tatiana. Um, so now I'm going to show you guys about Screencast O Matic. That means I have to get out of screen share figure this out. Okay. We have our pictures in the way. Yeah, P.S. if you've moved the photos, the, the pictures of people over your screen, stop share, you might have to move the gallery of photos before you can get back to your buttons. They're not lost, they're just hidden by the pictures, which just happened to me right now. So. Notice that we're still recording because I'm gonna have the whole thing recorded. This is where the recording um, status button tends to show up. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's in my top left corner. It lets me know that it's recording. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. So now you should be seeing my face. Um, what we're gonna see instead, I'm gonna share again. I'm gonna go back to share. I'm gonna share just my Google window now. You guys see uh, my Google window? Great. Um, so to do to get to Screencast-O-Matic, you can just go to screencast-o-matic.com, which is pretty easy. From here, you're gonna click Start Recording for Free. And from here, we're gonna say launch the free recorder. If you've never done it before, before you get to here, it's gonna ask you to download Screencast-O-Matic. You just wanna say yes to that. It'll be a really quick little download. Once it's downloaded it, you can click launch free recorder. You should still have your web window open. Okay, it's launching. If it isn't downloaded, you would have to download it right here is where the download would be. I'm gonna go ahead and open this. And it's getting ready to go. 
Okay. So my recorder is launched. Oh, it's down here. Hold on. Let me see if I can move it up. It's coming here. <laughs> uh, I've lost it under the cutoff. Let's see. Okay, I'm having a challenge getting it. I'm recording the wrong screen. Hold on. It doesn't want to do that. All right, hold on. Let me let me stop share. If you have two screens going and you're trying to do something fancy, um, you might have a challenge. And, and while Robbie is working, I just want to say, those of you who know me, know I'm not particularly technological, and I actually did the the screencast o -matic. Um, I did a couple of these at the very beginning of the break that we've had before I realized that I could do it over Zoom and I didn't have any trouble at all. So that's maybe because I weren't not fancy and I didn't have two screens like Robbie. Yeah, don't try to do two screens. So, okay, I'm on my regular screen. Can you guys see this black and white border? Thumbs up, woo, see? Perfect is the enemy of good. Aren't you proud of me, y'all? I'm just rolling right with this imperfection. Okay, so you can see my screen. It's capturing my screen. Oh, thanks, Al. Um, what you'll see here is this record dialog and then your options for what you want to record. Can you see that? You can record just your screen or you can record your webcam with no screen or you can record both. And that puts a little side picture of your, um, um, your webcam will be in the bottom corner. I'm just going to see if I can move these up. I'm still being fancy with my, oh, there I go. Good. Okay. So what you want to do is make sure that your, this little black window is capturing the black and white lines is capturing what you want and you can just pull on the sides to make it bigger or smaller. Once you're happy with what it's going to capture, everything within the black and white lines is what's going to be in your video. So if you've opened your PowerPoint, you can make sure that it's capturing your whole PowerPoint and then you're ready to go. Let me just switch over to here. Okay, so it's capturing this. You can say just screen and then you just click on the round red record button. Okay, it gives you a countdown. And now it's recording everything I say, everything that happens on the screen is being recorded. If I switch around and look at different things. It's all going to be captured within this little um, screencasting window and it captures my audio. When I'm all done, I push the pause button, which also means stop. Okay, now it asks me if I'm done or if I want to throw it away. I'm going to say it's all done and what I want to do is save it. Okay, now Al told me to hide this, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. Sorry, Al. So here's the thing. It does give you this option to upload to YouTube, but it is almost never working the last like month and a half. So don't even try it. Just ignore it. Pretend like it doesn't say upload to YouTube. Um, if somebody told you you might can have wings and fly, that'd be great, but it's probably not going to work. So don't even trust it. Go straight to video file. When you click that, it's going to save it to your computer, just like when we did Zoom. It's just going to save a file to your computer, which is what you want. You get to name it here on file name. You also get to say where you want it to go. So you have definite control of where Screencast-O-Matic is going to drop this file for you on your computer, which is a plus. So I'm going to just have it put me on the desktop, or if you wanted, you could browse your whole like file selection box, right? You could put it any place you like. I'll just say, put it in the downloads. Okay, that's all you have to do. Decide what is it called and where do you want it to go? And then you say publish. And it's gonna do its little thing. I recommend not rushing it or interrupting it. Just let it do its thing. Another good opportunity to get a cup of tea or coffee or your drink of choice. And then you can say all done. And then I'm done. Now it wants to try to sell me the pro version, which I'm just gonna ignore because if, you know, I don't need to worry about that. So now you have your recording from either way, both ways of getting a screencast, either with Zoom or with Screencast-O-Matic. And the last part is uploading it to YouTube. Um, 
Linda asks, asks a very good question. Is there a limit to how many videos we can make with a free version? And Al is busily answering that question. Um, no, the answer is no. But just, to, uh, Robbie, aren't I right? There was Screencast-O-Matic, there is a 15 minute limit for each video. That is true. And that is also gonna help you with best practice. <laughs> you really don't want one longer than that. For multiple problems, um, multiple reasons, one of them is that larger files are more challenging to manage and deal with. And also for learning, it's better to keep it under 15. So um, if you need to do longer, we have, um, there are some other sort of um, options and Zoom can do longer than 15 minutes if you want. Bye, Jessica. Um, okay, so let's go back to my, my screencasting. PowerPoint. You guys see that? Can you see my slides? Great. So next part is upload to YouTube. Oh yeah, this was the part I wanted to show you live. Okay. Never mind. I was getting ahead of myself. So to go to YouTube, this is really easy. Um, what I'm going to have you do is go through online tools at Pacific. Online tools, Pacific University. And because I go there a lot, my browser remembers. Go all the way down to Boxer Apps. Now, if you have a faster way that you normally get to Boxer Apps, by all means, use it. But if you don't know how to make sure you're logged into your Boxer Gmail Google account, you can go to Online Tools, Boxer Apps, and you'll know for sure that you're logging in with the Pacific account and not a personal account that could be interfering. That's a really important step. Okay, once you're sure you're in your Boxer apps and you can tell because it says Boxer apps right here, you're going to click on the waffle. That's this three by three grid. Looks like a toaster waffle. And then you go down to YouTube. What you'll see when you first land here is videos that you might want to watch. What you want to do is um, upload a, a video. So you click on this video camera with the plus on it, and then you say upload a video. And what you're going to get is two things happen. One thing is YouTube takes you to your creator studio where your channel is, and it also gives you a drag and drop window or upload if you really want to for the video file that you have. So you can say select a file. And it's going to open the files on your computer. Here happens to be Robbie's screencast. It's an MP4. Remember, that's what your video file is going to look like if you need an extra clue if you're looking at the right thing. MP4. And I remember that I called it screencast. So I'm just going to click on that and say open. And now it looks like you're driving in the snow. And that's how you know it's going. Then it pops up to this one. Here you have another opportunity to change the name of your video. Now this is the name that will be attached to your actual YouTube video. So you want to name it something that makes sense. If it's part one of multiple parts of a series of video lectures, you want to make sure you're clear about that. You have to come down and say, yes, it's made for kids or no, it is not. That's a new uh, regulation. Once you have set that right now, I never have to say that again because it keeps filling that in automatically for me. But that's an important thing. Probably the first time you'll have to select that. It's a good idea right now while you're here to capture this link. This is the link that will get you back to your video. You can just command C or copy, however you copy. So now you've got that, the, the link to your video, just in case you have a hard time finding your way back to it. If you have a separate Word document open or a notepad or somewhere where you can paste those things, that maybe is a little helpful hack, just to keep that video link handy. So you don't have to hunt it up again in YouTube. Okay, so we've got the link. We're gonna say it's not made for kids and we're gonna go to the next screen, which you can completely ignore. This is a screen for YouTubers who wanna do fancy things about end screen, front screen. You don't wanna do any of those things. Next. And here's where you decide what kind of publication access you're gonna give this. You could do public, in which case anybody can look at it and search for it or unlisted, which means people have to have the link to see the video. So this is what most people choose. And unless someone gives your link to your video to someone else, nobody else is gonna see it. 
So for the most part, this is pretty safe. Jessica, I think, stepped away. But this question came up like, well, if they recorded children and then those kids' grandparents got it, they wanted to post it to Facebook, well, it would still be visible to anybody who had that link. But if you're giving this to your students and putting it in Moodle, it's highly unlikely that it's going to go anywhere beyond your student view. And who knows, maybe you'll be viral and famous, but um, that's not usually how it goes. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it unlisted. And that's the last thing I have to say that I just say save. I'm all done. Now it's going to be, it was so short that it's already published because it was a 23 second video. If yours is up to 15 minutes, it's going to take much, much longer to process. So bear that in mind when you start uh, making your videos. Um, we highly encourage you to do little, little short practice videos that don't matter so you can walk through all steps of the process. Again, you have that opportunity to copy your link if you want to, um, but if you've got it already, you're good. Now you can close, and the place it leaves you in is in your, your channel or your um, creator studio, it's sometimes called. And here's where you can see um, all of your videos. It's doing something fancy here. I don't know what this is. Let's refresh. Oh, there it goes. So all the videos I have made and uploaded are here in this drop down list. And you can get back to it and you can um, get the shareable link again or download it or delete it. Um, you can edit it. So lots of different things that you can see here. Okay, so that's how to upload a video. I see your hand, Nancy, one second. The other thing I'm gonna show you next is what if you have a video that's longer than 15 minutes? First of all, we're never gonna shame you about that. Um, secondly, YouTube will not let you put anything more than 15 minutes unless you verify your account, which is making sure that you're not a robot. So I'm gonna show, I can't show you that live because I've already verified this account and all the accounts that I've created, there's like six of them but I have some screenshots that I can show you in just a sec. Did you have a question about this though first? Yeah, that just, I was just wondering, can we make folders in this YouTube uh, channel videos on our little, so that I have like all my Spanish 325 class has like their videos in one space and do they have that or not? You can make a playlist. Can you see this mm -hmm. over here under videos, playlists? Yes. I haven't played with this very much. So this is me being all brave of it. So. On my Setsi video tutorials, I have six videos on a playlist, but it looks like you can just click plus and make a new playlist. Hold on. <laughs> I was trying to be clever. See how many times I mistyped that? <laughs> just couldn't deliver that joke. It's okay. So right now I have no videos on here, but um, you can go back to your videos and add them. I'm not exactly sure how to add videos. But we can look into that if somebody really, if you really want to create playlists, let me know. We can work on that. Um, and or when you're actually in the videos, you can edit them and add them to a playlist. So let's go ahead and, um, oh, it's going to start playing. Pause. You can edit the video here once, even from when it's playing. I don't know how my time is. Oh, I'm at the, at the end, at the end. Oh, right here. Under, so you have the, the link. Do you see this here? Here's the link and it's unlisted. You can change that if you want to. Even like after the class, if you want to make it private, you could do that once your students have done all they need to do with it. And your students can do this too. At the end of the course, if they want to make it private or they just want to delete it, they can always come back and do that. So they don't have to make their videos. I know that Nancy, you want your students to make videos. You don't have, they don't have to leave them um, accessible forever. Um, so here's where you can put it, select a playlist you want it to go on. Done. There you go. Okay, there we go. Save. Changes to the video, and now it's done. All right, so I'm going to go back. This is like the very end of um, the very end of our video here, or end of our presentation. I'm going to go ahead and present the end. You guys are hanging in there really well. Much longer than 15 minutes, isn't it? Um, hey, Robbie. Yeah. Um, there's been questions here. I've been trying to tell people in a chat, and I don't know if I've been entirely successful. Uh -huh. uh, can you show people how from the main YouTube window you can get back into studio so you can edit your videos that you've already posted? Yes. Sure. Great. So we'll go back to the videos. Here you're in, you can see all the videos here. You can edit further. it. Could you, could you go all the way back to the YouTube homepage? 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We need okay. to know how to get to here. Okay. 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 So we're at YouTube studio. I might just have to go back to my YouTube to begin with. Okay. Great. So when you're in Boxer apps, you click on the waffle, click on YouTube, and that drops you to your regular YouTube where you see all the funny things you want to watch or that they think you want to watch. You can either go into your videos right here. So that's one way to get there. The other way, if you forget that, is if you still click on the upload video button, it's going to take you straight into your editor. And you can just say, never mind, I change, I don't want to upload a video, and you're going to stay in your creator studio. So there's two ways to get there. If you forget, and all you remember is the plus sign in the video camera, you'll get into the upload video and then just close that window and you'll be in Creator Studio. Um, alternatively, you can click on your videos and it will take you to Creator Studio, or at least to your videos. YouTube Studio is the big button here where you can go there too. And Robbie, okay. there's, even, there's even one more way. One more way, what's the other way? If you go up into the top right hand corner where your account is. Here? Yep, click on that. And then you can go to YouTube Studio straight from there. And that again takes you back and then you can go to your videos. Yep. And so, get to the window. With many things, there are multiple avenues. If you, one of, if you remember one of those, you'll be able to get there. Does that answer the question that we had about how to get back to edit those videos? One thing I will show you if it will let me have the option. Let's see, let's try editing this one. Let's see, edit title and description. Now, oh, interesting, I think I need to play it to edit it. Oh, here we go. If you click on it to edit, you might wanna pick the thumbnail. Uh, YouTube decides which picture it thinks is the best. And this is the picture that's sort of like waiting on that panel of all the videos. Um, you can say which one, not this one, because it looks like I have a headache. And you know, this is not the most, this is maybe the most flattering one, so I'm gonna pick that one. But it gives you a couple of options, or if you have your own picture, you can upload that. Just in case it lands on one when your mouth is open and you're like, I do not want that to be the landing page for everything. Perfect could be the enemy of good here, but you have the option of maybe slightly better. Just so you know, I have found that to be very helpful <laughs> and I wanted to share that one. Okay. So if you, so just re remember that YouTube Studio, the three ways to get there, you will need to be in YouTube Studio to do the last little piece you have to do um, in order to be able to um, upload longer videos. So you're going to do these four little steps here. One of them is you're gonna log into your Creator Studio somehow, you're gonna get there. You're gonna, on another tab, while that tab is open, you're gonna open a new tab in the browser and you're gonna to go to youtube.com slash verify. It's a special little YouTube address, or a little URL address. Um, it's gonna ask you for your phone number, and then it's gonna send your phone a code, and you're gonna type the code back in, and then you'll be able to record, upload videos longer than 15 minutes. You gotta do that little step. So here's what the screens look like. youtube.com slash verify. Um, my channel videos are open here, as you can see. So that's my studio. You do have to be logged into your YouTube studio for this to work. And then you'll also go to a new tab where you type in youtube.com slash verify. Then it's going to give you this screen where it wants to verify that you're not a robot. Um, I said text, but you could have it call you if you really want it. They're going to give you a code. And then you enter those codes. And then you say continue and then your, it will let you upload videos longer than 15 minutes. Got to do that little hack. Um, the last step, I know I'm over time, but I'm gonna be quick. You guys wanna see how to do this, I think, um, is how to embed those videos in Moodle. It's actually really easy. In order to do that, we're gonna to go to Moodle, go to where your class where you want it to go, and then you're gonna turn editing on, like always. And anywhere you have an editor, let's just get a, a word, um, a text editor open. You can tell you're in a text editor because it's got all of these familiar buttons and this tan ribbon here. Anytime you have that, you know you're in a text editor. And I click on this linking button. 
and you can paste that YouTube link that you had, the share link. Just say create the link and almost like magic, save and return to course, it's going to embed your video right on the page or right on whatever you make. So this was a label and a label is visible right on the front page. You can also do the same thing with a page. This is an example of that. <laughs> you can do it as many times as you like. <laughs> um, this is um, a Moodle page and you can see that in the content section, not the description section, I always make that mistake. In the content section, if you just drop in your link and make it a live hyperlink, and then you save, your students will be able to see your video right away. So they can play it in Moodle or they can, if they start to play it, they can pop out to YouTube. Robbie, I have a question. Yes. When you're, sure. so this page, I, I've never used page in Moodle before, but it looks like I, is it possible for me to put every one of my lectures on that one page, just like you hit three of that same? It's possible, but pedagogically it may not be the best choice. It's good to have all the learning content for students clustered together. Everything they need to know in order to do a specific task um, should be together. So if you're asking them to perform on an exam or a quiz and your instructional video goes with that quiz, you might want to put all those things together. And then when you move to the next chapter, the next unit, you might want those elements to be chunked together. But you can put as many as you want on the page. And to create a page, you just add an activity or resource anywhere you see this option. And page is almost at the bottom. Add. And then you'll give it a name. Skip the first box, which is the mistake I make continuously. Go to the second box. Start with the little link and paste your link in. When you say create, and then save and display, it's gonna be here. So the benefit to putting it on a page versus just um, say, for example, maybe editing the actual section itself, where you could also put a link if you wanted, it's the difference is they just have this amount of space taken up on your page versus this amount of space. So if you have seven or eight of them, they're going to have to scroll forever to get to the stuff. It might be better for organization's sake to put those on a page. But you can do either one. If you, if you have a welcome back to the future kind of video that you made to welcome them back to your class, you might want to put that right here on the general. You might want to edit this section and drop it right there. They can't possibly miss it. But then subsequent ones you might actually want to um, put on pages. Yeah, that's a good thought. Good thought. Um, so that's how you upload them to Moodle. Moodle will embed them automatically for you. All you have to do is make it a hyperlink. And, and Robbie, can students upload to Moodle or no? Because, or do they have to send it to me as an email or how does that work? Nope. You see this discussion form here? Let me just view as a student really quick. And I'll show you how a student could do it. So if you make a discussion forum for students, this is if you want everybody to see each other's because the discussion form is open to everybody. If you're okay with everybody seeing the videos, then you make a discussion forum and it's got this blue and green speech bubble. You, if you're the student, you could add a new discussion topic. Then you just add the link as the student. I know it, I've published my thing to YouTube. I've got the link. I create it here, I post it to the forum, and then anybody can see it. Oh, look, this looks like it's a good video. Oh, yep, there it is. Students um, can also embed that to you in an assignment tool. Let's see if I have any assignments built in here. I do. So if you want them, if you don't want other people to see the video, like only the student and me, we are the only people who can see this. Then as the student, oh, I would have to edit my submission. Pretend like I hadn't submitted to this before. Okay, this one actually I would need to change it. You would need to set it so that they can, um, I would have to make a small edit, hold on. Give me one second here. As the teacher, you wanna set it up so that they can do online text. 
not file submission because they're embedding a link, not attaching a file. So you would want to do um, online text. If you set your um, assignment for that, then your student will have a text editor just like you have. Same exact Moodle text editor, same exact process. Then if you wanted to view those submissions, you can see that it's right here, or if you wanted to grade it, and then you can open, I don't know if you can see these bottom little options here, you can open it up so that um, you, it fills the screen and you can see it, then you could give it a grade, you could give them comments on it, um, if you just want to be the only one who sees it. So those are the two decisions to make. Do you want everybody to see the videos or just um, you and the student? Yes. Robbie, just to follow up, if you want to have everyone, all the students see the each other's videos, have them upload it to a discussion forum, do you have to click on the online text thing in the discussion forum? Nope. They, you don't need to. Okay, perfect. By default, they'll have that option Perfect. right here. The discussion forum also lets them upload, but they won't need to do that. You just want them to drop it in here. And you want to give them clear instructions. Please copy paste, you know, or make your YouTube link, a hyperlink here. If they forget and they just paste it like this, then um, it won't be embedded, but it will still be there. Oh, look, it did. I just pasted it all. I didn't even make it as a link. So who That's knows what you're going to get. But if it's just a link to YouTube, then just click on it. <laughs> okay. You can get Thank there, you. I promise. So beautiful. Thank you. Yes. So that brings me to the end, but I'm not going to stop sharing in case you guys want me to show you something else. Hanu, do you have a question? Um, can you unmute real quick? Yeah, no, I, I, you're doing great. I, I was oh, uh, really okay. appreciative. Thank you. Super. Any other questions before I stop share and stop recording? OK, I'm going to start with the stop share, which sounds sort of backwards. And I'm going to officially sign off of the recording here. I'm going to stop my recording. And to do that, I can come up here at the top where the status bar is and stop, or I can stop down at the bottom of my window.